Commander Riker teaches Data how to whistle, Armis kills Tasha Yar, and Dr. Pulaski can't save Deanna Troy's child. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of, well, an episode that covers all of those things. It is TNG's <laughs> Season 2, Episode 22, Shades of Grey, story by Maurice Hurley. Teleplay by Maurice Hurley and Richard Manning and Hans Beimler. Directed by Rob Bowman. This was July 15th, 1989. Where were you? We've got a very special guest, everybody. Can you believe it? This is going to be a good one. We've got Eric Stillwell joining us all the way from France. What's up, Eric? How are you today? Hey, it's great to be with you. Awesome to have you. Also, everybody, very quickly, we do have a very special thanks to give out to... Michael C. Bazaruski. Thank you very much, Michael C. Bazaruski, for sponsoring this episode. This guy gets it. Uh, we appreciate you. Well, let's just get into it. Um, what's up, Srock? <laughs> oh, final episode here. This is it. Um, of this of this season. And I got a whole bunch of fa- flash ba- flashback sequences, which is something that I kind of like a lot. Um, but yeah, Eric, um, this is it, man. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the the season finale. I I really have a big question about, uh, for one, this is the 22nd episode, not the 26th is what we would usually uh, expect by now. So this was a shortened season due to the strike that happened and a, a little insight on just the kind of uh, problems you ran into because of the strike. Uh, I would like to kind of start there. Well, the season obviously started late because the writer strike happened at the end of the first season and prolonged the hiatus that we normally, we didn't have long hiatuses back then because 26 episodes pretty much took up the the full year but so we did start late on season two so we were going to be short four episodes to begin with and mm-hmm. then of course the studio was uh, hyper focused on budgets so by the end of the season they had already spent too much money and the studio wanted to do a clip show and, and uh, ironically, it could have been a cliffhanger since Riker was on the, the, the verge of death. Can least. you imagine if they did? They made a cliffhanger, <laughs> and then season three, episode one, was another clip show. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> man, we got you guys so good. But Eric, can you tell us how you originally got the gig to work on Star Trek? Were you a big fan beforehand, and it was just everything you've ever wanted? Or did you get stuck with it, and you're like, I don't like Star Trek? And what no, was I, that job? <laughs> I was a huge uh, Star Trek fan f- from my childhood. I, I think as early as nine, I started watching reruns of the original series in the early 1970s. Um, I was I was only three when the original series started, but by the early 70s, I was old enough to appreciate it. A friend of mine introduced me to it, and I became a huge fan. And even when the local station, I lived in Idaho because my dad was in the Air Force. We were stationed at Mountain Home Air Force Base. And the the local station in Boise took the show off the air for the summer and put Perry Mason reruns on. So my friends and I started a, 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 a signature campaign and sent a petition into the TV station. And they promised us they would bring it back in the fall, which they did. And they also sent me some pretty cool, you know, black and white PR photos of Kirk and Spock. So I was a huge fan. And by the late seventies, I was involved in um, Star Trek fandom and I uh, was involved with the international Star Trek club called Starfleet. And I became the president of the organization and uh, Mm -hmm. it, it kind of grew like really exponentially in the early 80s because of the movies coming out um so that's how i originally um had some contacts at the studio because gene roddenberry and his assistant susan were honorary members of the club and 
when I found out that they were going to do Next Generation, I immediately like sent in my resume. I worked on this one TV production filmed up in Oregon, which was called Promise with James Garner and James Woods. And it was a Hallmark Hall of Fame TV movie, which ended up winning like the the most awards ever in the history of television for a for a TV movie. Hmm. It also had Piper Laurie in it, who recently passed away, and she won an Emmy for that for that TV movie, and um, it won a human a humanist humanitas award and uh all sorts of awards emmys up to wazoo so anyway i had this resume with just that one project on it and i sent it in to susan sackett who passed it along to eddie milkus who passed it along to bob justman and eventually i got called in for an interview but i didn't get the job from the interview because they ended yeah. up Plot PA. twist. <laughs> well, they hired two um, people who had already worked at the studio in some capacity, like mailroom or tour guide, whatever. So I thought, well, then I'm going to go to Hollywood and get a job as a, a tour guide at Paramount Pictures. And so I did. And then a, a couple of months later, uh, one of the original PAs got promoted. David Takamura, he got promoted to post-production. And I had run into Bob Justman at the first screening of the pilot episode, Encounter at Farpoint, which they had screened for the cast and crew at one of the theaters on the lot. And Bob saw, I was hired by my, I was a um, tour guide at the studio and my boss um, had asked me one day, if I wanted to do door duty at the screening that they were doing for Star Trek, I'm like, sure. Because <laughs> the, the cool thing was after you check everyone into the theater, you can stay and watch it. So I got to see the pilot episode along with the cast and crew and Bob Justman remembered me. And, <laughs> and literally like a day or two later, days later, he called me and said, are you still interested in working on, on Star Trek? Cause we have an opening. And I went into his office and I actually said something the dumbest thing I've ever said in my life. <laughs> I, I thought, well, normally, you know, we're supposed to give like two weeks notice if you're going to quit your job. <laughs> and Bob yelled out to his assistant, Carol Eisner. He's like, Carol, bring in the stack of resumes for this position. And it was like, you know, two feet thick. And he's like, if you don't want the job, there's a lot. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. Start tomorrow, 6 a.m. That's hilarious. Wow. I was a production assistant for the first two seasons and towards the end of the second season. I don't remember exactly when, but I um, became the uh, script coordinator mm -hmm. for the series. So, uh, first of all, I have to admire your determination there, Eric, because you literally took a gamble and said, I'm going to pick up and move to Hollywood and just try to get a job as a tour guide to hopefully one day get in at Star Trek. So that, that, that was a total, like, gamble yeah. as much as you can probably gamble in life. It's pretty yeah. unbelievable, yeah. And how great is it that it actually worked, too? It did. Like, you yeah. made it happen. <laughs> I have to admire that. I still mm -hmm. pinch myself when I think back at it because it just seems almost impossible that that would happen. So, wow. Fast forward a bit, you're working on the show for a couple years. Then, towards the end of the second year, uh, somebody taps on your shoulder and says, Hey, Eric, I got a job for you. I hope you don't have any weekend plans. Or, what, how did that go? What, and what was the job? I was trying to remember exactly who it was, if it was Maurice Hurley or if it was Rick Berman. I think it was Rick Berman because he had very specific assignment for me. It was the last episode. They were doing this clip show. It was Maurice Hurley's last episode before he left. And he had written this basically skeleton outline for the show that um, I guess originally... Um, Rob Bowman thought he was going to have five days instead of the normal seven days 
to shoot this outline, but they only gave him three days to, to do it wow. to save money. And so Rick Berman said, we need to fill a bunch of gaps with clips from the first 47 episodes, believe it or not. 47 is always showing up in Star Trek. Yeah, yes, it so is. There were 47 episodes prior to Shades of Grey. So okay. I had to literally go to um, an edit bay over in the post-production department with a library of 47 episodes of Next Generation on three-quarter VHS tape. And I had to screen all of the episodes, log create basically a catalog of scenes that could be memories that Riker would have. So it was mostly Riker scenes from all the different episodes. And I had to go through and then also categorize them into like certain types of emotion, like fear, mm -hmm. anger, love, you know, sexuality, whatever category it would fall into. And uh, that pr project took me 80 hours in one week, in five days, basically, 80 hours. And it was exhausting, but Rick wanted to have all these clips because I had to basically list the time code of each scene from each episode mm. and where it started, where it ended. So he could just go and look at these scenes and uh, <clears throat> and then pick the ones that they wanted to use as Riker's dreams during the sequences that are used in the episode. But that was that was a pretty overwhelming assignment that I managed to pull it off. Wow. Um, yeah, I bet you could, you wish you had like a Blu-ray player or a, yeah. some kind of Paramount Plus account. Would have yes, really helped that's what I was that. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but um so you bring up a lot of things and you know um these names kind of float around and we've been watching this show now for two seasons and um some of the names that keep popping up are for us maurice hurley and rob bowman and you and you brought up the fact that uh, maurice was this was his kind of last uh hoorah for the next generation um can you give us a little bit of about Maurice Hurley and just give us some insight about his character, about his work ethic or just whatever offhand stories you might have. And also Rob Bowman is somebody that we want to pry into because uh, a lot of his directing style has become really a signature uh, storytelling for Next Generation and, some, and we've been real fans of his throughout the course of watching this uh, first two seasons. So just a little insight on how those men work and, and the kind of passion that they have for uh, the show. Well, um, Rob Bowman was one of the youngest directors that they had used on the show. And he, he definitely, he was very friendly, nice, easygoing guy. I was a production assistant during most of that time, but I was assigned um, mostly to working with the writing staff over in the heart building it's, back in the day in the first season we were actually in a trailer in the middle of the back lot <laughs> trailer okay. i think it was trailer 24 um so that's where i was stationed for my little errands all over the lot all the time so i didn't get to really spend that much time with bob or rob bowman but i remember getting his lunch a few times <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my jobs and then Maurice, oh, that's better than eating his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> they called him Rob Chicken Salad Bowman. <laughs> and uh, Maurice Hurley was uh, the showrunner, head writer, basically uh, Gene Rodberry at the time. Um, and I had more interactions with him because one of the ones I, I most distinctly remember was at the end of the first season, right before the right when the writer strike was starting up, they weren't supposed to be writing <laughs> and they were doing a, the neutral zone, which was this episode with some Romulan characters. And I yeah. remember Maurice Hurley coming into the production trailer and he basically did uh 
stand over my shoulder and he's like, Eric, I, I have an assignment for you. I, I need some names for some Romulan characters. They all knew I was a Star Trek fan. So it was like they would come and ask me these crazy questions. And he's like, I need a name for a couple of Romulan characters in the script that we're doing. And I, I just, I was so naive back then. I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? Just make up some names? He's like, no. <laughs> Look them up in a Romulan encyclopedia. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to make up the names for the two Romulans in the neutral zone. And and so I think every now and then, you know, they would ask me for these little, little Star Trek-ish things if they got stuck. And Morris was a nice guy, but I, I know that... Um, I don't think he was particularly happy. It was, it wasn't easy working with Gene's notes on a lot mm. of the scripts because um, Gene had very specific ideas about how he wanted to do things in it, and so it wasn't like Maurice could just do anything he wanted. At one point in time, he wanted to buy a spec script that I wrote. And uh, I, I had written it during the writer's strike when we were off for so many months. I had to go back to Oregon mm. and stay with my parents until the strike was over and then come back to Hollywood. And I wrote this spec script called um, Shattered Time, which was basically uh, an analogy of sort of like the Star Wars weapon defense program that was going on back in the 80s. And um Maurice liked the script and he showed it to Sam Friedel, who was the, the production manager, and Sam loved it. And apparently he showed it to one of the studio executives, Tim Isofano, and they, they were all telling me how much they loved my script and they wanted to buy it. And I was thinking, oh, my God, this is actually happening. And and then, of course, Gene nixed it. <laughs> he didn't like it. Damn. Which really sort of sucked because Gene was always my idol as a kid growing up and because mm. he was the creator of Star Trek and then he was the one who put the silver bullet through my heart. But there <laughs> is a uh, happy ending to the story. Everybody at home, uh, Eric did sell two story ideas, uh, one to Next Generation and one to Voyager. I think the Voyager one maybe was like first season, ninth yeah. episode, yeah. right around there. Yeah. And uh, the Next Generation one that he did uh, pitch that did well was Yesterday's Enterprise, which is a very beloved episode coming up in the third season. So there's definitely a happy ending there. Uh, Eric, can you tell us, though, a regular day on the set of Star Trek or in the back lot of Paramount, say season two. Um, and was there ever a moment where you actually walked onto the bridge of the Enterprise and thought, wow, this is it. I'm actually here on this bridge. Well, as a production assistant, my primary role was delivering memos and script revisions to studio executives and to the set and whatever Texts. department. So I had a bike and I used, I had, there was only one other production assistant, Heidi, who was a friend of mine, also from Oregon. And we ran all around the lot delivering stuff day in and day out. Um, some of the weird highlights of being a production assistant was I also had to go collect petty cash envelopes for the actors from the from the studio cashier's office. And Marina was one of the ones who got petty cash for because they would get like facials and stuff on the weekends because of all the makeup and everything. Right. And she'd always be like, Eric, where's my petty cash? <laughs> I, was always, I was always terrified of Marina. Because she was always <laughs> the only reason she was ever looking for me was she wanted her petty <laughs> cash. So that I mean, and I would pick up lunches, deliver lunches, and um, and I so as one of the two PAs, I sort of started focusing more on the running errands for the writing department because the other PA wanted to do more set stuff and makeup and uh, hair and wardrobe and all that. So I did a lot of work with running the scripts back and forth to the print shop. I mean, it's so weird talking about it now because now 
the print shop probably doesn't even exist because everything's just emailed out to people. But right. back then we actually had physical hard copies of every script and all the different colored revisions and pages constantly going back and forth. And so that's how I became more involved with the writing staff. And eventually one of the, um, the script coordinator who was assigned to the show had gone on a medical leave of absence and she just never came back and we never heard from her. Nobody knew what happened to her. Wow. And the woman who um, was basically the script typist who was doing the job for quite a while, a shelf fell on her face. <laughs> just a, a shelf that was above her typewriter just fell down one day and broke her nose and she had to leave and she was hospitalized for a while and <laughs> And suddenly I was thrust into like doing the script coordinator's job and keeping that department running in it. By the beginning of the third season, I had actually been given the job of script coordinator and uh, Maurice Hurley had left. And before Michael Pillar started, they had another showrunner come in named Michael Wagner. And he was just overwhelmed with the the job because there weren't any scripts and he he finally he just quit <laughs> and michael pillar was like the runner-up um candidate so they called him back in and he eventually took the job but during this gap between showrunners i would be going over to rick berman's office every day and taking his script notes and going back and doing the changes and working with the script typist and that's how i became the script coordinator on the show wow it's bedlam it was it was yeah. a i mean so <laughs> many crazy <laughs> things year. happened like in the first season um, i started during the 13th episode of the first season which is just around the time that the whole staff was changing because of the issues that happened with DC Fontana and, and you know, the original writing staff who were all going out the door and I was coming in and it was very political and, and, and weird feeling. So for me, I was kind of like thinking, I always dreamed of working on Star Trek and, you know, it's all about this great reality of people working together. And it was sort of like the whole opposite thing going on in real life. But on the days that I had to run stuff down to the set and visit the, the sets and go on the bridge, the thing that I, that used to stop me in my tracks really was between the sound stages, you could look up in the hills and see the Hollywood sign. And I'd be like, I can't believe I'm I'm here in Hollywood, you know, running my ass off. But I <laughs> I have this like dream job, and it was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, uh, you know, Star Trek is really one of the few, if not the only, franchise that the fans of it are actually the ones that are writing the stories or helping to create these stories. You mentioned coming up with character names and. You know, you, you were you weren't even a writer at that point officially, and here you are being asked to give us some, you know, Romulan names. So, um, and I, I, we've seen this kind of thing happen over and over again, where uh, people who are involved with the show are also fans, and then they end up becoming part of the tapestry. And I, I, I think that's one of the remarkable things of it. Um, wh what are some of the, you know, the the good memories that you had when you were on the show, like as far as what was the thing that you just couldn't believe that you were there seeing? Was it the set? Was it the bridge of uh, the enterprise or, or was it uh, being in the back room discussions and seeing how, you know, the soup was made? Well, it was always cool to be on the, the, the sets because the sets were pretty amazing. I mean, especially Deep Space Nine, the sets were pretty mind boggling yeah. especially the promenade because you feel like you're really on a space stage <laughs> it, yes. and uh, and on the enterprise especially in the corridors where you can't see the end or the beginning of you feel like you're really on a sh on a spaceship um, yeah. but so i loved all those things but there was there was always a catch-22 to everything in, in my experience like because i was a, a fan and people found out i 
was a Star Trek fan, people would always be coming up to me and asking me, how much could you get for this prop? <laughs> I'm like, I don't. I really honestly. <laughs> You're like, but this I'll take it off your eBay. hands for 15 bucks right now. <laughs> this is before um, eBay, and then everybody. <laughs> one time they were filming uh, one of the movies, uh, the original cast movies, I think it was Star Trek V. And I heard a news report that the sets had been broken into and and someone stole the, the captain's chair from the original Enterprise set in some of the costumes. And then I found out that Car Bennett's office had called Gene Roddenberry's office to find out if I still worked at the at the studio, like basically accusing me of being a suspect. Wow. It, it was always that was- like that that was um, disappointing to me because I loved Star Trek so much, but I would never do, I would never steal anything or sell the props. And um and then when we did yesterday's Enterprise, I I spent a little more time down on the sets because I wanted to watch them filming our episode. And and uh, the situation occurred on Ten Forward where Whoopi Goldberg wanted to uh, change one of the lines in in her dialogue, and someone said, "Oh, well, here's one of the writers," and I'm like, "Oh no, nice, <laughs> don't talk That's to cool. me." Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Rick Berman. Me. You got yeah. Dr. Rick Berman. So um, I was, you know, polite and told her hey, I would let the production office know that she wanted to talk to Rick about a line change. So I called David Livingston and I told him. And then the next thing I find out is Rick is furious because what is Eric Stillwell doing on the set? Why is he talking to Whoopi Goldberg? And then I, yeah. I just noticed that I've been banned from the set. And I'm like, why is this yeah. to me? I was doing everything <laughs> really? right. You're like, I love Star Trek. Why is Star Trek being mean to me? And I was doing everything the way it should be. I was making sure that the message got passed along. I didn't yeah. promise to do anything for her. And mm. anyway, it was always something, you know, the ups and downs of it all. Yeah. But the funny thing about so you, you were a scapegoat. In, you were a scapegoat in a lot of situations. I mean, oh, yeah. that's what PAs are a lot of times, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I don't know, Sirak, if you remember Richard Arnold. I do. I well, do. he was jealous of any other fan who worked there. So he was always trying to undermine me and get me in trouble oh. for stuff. And uh, it was just so frustrating. And the more things change, the, the more they stay the same with fandom around here because uh, yeah. the fans can be pretty cutthroat. Uh, yeah. Eric, we only have you for another minute here, but I yeah. think uh, you're you're finishing up a thought there. I, well, I wanted to say something about Shades of Grey because I they asked mm. me what, what should we call this episode, and I said I think we should call it Riker's Brain. <laughs> That's hilarious <laughs> because that. Because all the fans know that Spock's, Spock's brain, brain one of the most unpopular episodes, and we knew this clip yeah. was going to be horrible. Yeah, <laughs> Although I did get my very first screen credit <laughs> as a researcher at the yeah. end of the show. Um, but yeah, they they kind of uh, found out about the Spock's brain thing and said we can't call it Riker's brain and. So I said, well, how about Shades of Grey? Because it, there's it, there's no black and white to this episode. It's just this weird hodgepodge. And that's what, how it got the name. And history was made. Well, wow. uh, Eric, this has been so much fun having you. Uh, super yeah. excited that we got the chance to talk with you and really appreciate that you took the time way out in France. It's like two in the morning for you practically over there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we do hope to have you again uh, soon sometime, yes, Eric. Is Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I, I've heard a lot of good things. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard a lot of good things about that. And, so. and tell Denise Crosby she's got to co-host that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh we we are harassing she's not going to get out of it you watch <laughs> but anyway uh thank you very much eric we really appreciate you taking the time yeah. with us it's been amazing You're meeting welcome. everybody at home stick around we're going to cover this glorious episode a bit more on the other side we'll be right back on 
the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. All right. Here are the trivioids of the week. And they go a little something like this. Something jabbed Commander Riker in the calf. Dr. Pulaski is not a fan of comical transporter chiefs. The Enterprise is on a geological survey on Surya 4. Did I get that right? Commander Riker mm-hmm. has been infected by an unidentified microbe. Commander Riker hopes they don't find out he's faking it. If you drop a hammer on your foot, it's hardly useful to get mad at the hammer. Commander Riker's great-grandfather once got bit by a rattlesnake. After three days of intense pain, the snake died. Doc, I think that's a. I think that's also a, a, what's that dude's? I can't think straight. What's that guy's name? Uh, which guy? The the karate guy, not the Bruce Lee guy, but the dude with the shaggy hair. I'll remember it in a uh, second. Okay, okay, not Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris, thank you. It's a Chuck Norris joke, is what that sounds like to me. Okay. Sorry, we got, I got a pile driver next door that's breaking my brain. Continuing on, Dr. Pulaski <laughs> wants five milligrams of tricordrazine handy. Commander Riker teaches Data how to whistle. Armas kills Tasha Yar, and Dr. Pulaski can't save Deanna Troy's child. All right, everybody, please make sure to like this video. Please subscribe to this channel. If you're listening in, leave us a five-star rating and a nice review. We'd really appreciate it. If you're watching, go subscribe to us wherever podcasts are found. If you're listening, head over to YouTube and find us and uh, subscribe to our channel. All right, let's get into this one, Sirach. Finally, we've been talking about this episode for two full seasons because we cannot wait to know what you think about Shades of Grey. Best episode ever? What do you think? <laughs> I don't know about best episode ever. <laughs> um, it was a good episode. It was good. Um, it moved along well. I thought Rob Bowman did one of his classic you know, directorial jobs of making the part that he was moving feel fluidic. Um, he also does a great job of showing you, uh, the different sets, for example, the, um, planet surface that they were on for the, uh, location for the planetary location that they were on. Um, so yeah, uh, another hats off moment for Rob Bowman. I thought he just really set the tone for this whole really show in general, because he's the directing style has really become signature for what you know what you want on these um next generation episodes um but yeah no you know i i I really wish i could have asked eric this question because this was another question now that just came to mind after he's gone now but when you have an episode with this many flashbacks and eric's over there going through the archives of 47 episodes trying to find scenes so none of that is written then uh, and I wonder what the actual script l- would look like for this episode. Was it only like 25 right. pages? 20 long? pages. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, it's like, and then it's just a bunch of scribbles of like, uh, Riker goes through negative emotions or Riker goes through happy emotions. Right. So I wonder, um, you know, when you have that much flashback material, it felt like half of the episode was almost flashback. So you would expect that the script wasn't that long in this particular writing um in this version so i i wondered you know what that looked like since um i'm sure eric was handling the script for this episode as well but you know it started off really well um right away got me intrigued you know just there on the planet surface and usually they start in inside of the ship or something but this time they started right on the planet surface we don't know where they are where they're at we just know that they're doing some kind of you know, um, scientific exploration work or looking for something. Um, so I, I like to start. I really like Dr. Pulaski in this episode. She's continuously being uh, growing on me as a character. And there's just moments of subtle, subtle moments that I think she really shines at. She um, 
is very good at exuding senior officer vibes. And when she, for example, checks O'Brien in the opening credit when he's trying to make a little joke saying, I hope he's the right coordination subordinate. And she gives him a cuts and look at him. Uh, I really like the way she delivered her line about how not liking comical transporter chiefs or whatnot. I thought she 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 maintains a level of professionalism, but also stern, like no nonsense. I don't play around in in certain areas of discussion. In this particular one, uh, where it comes to beaming and stuff, where she has an anxiety, uh, she don't play. And I like that. She also uses that same level of authority when dealing with Picard. And I think she's one of the few people that is able to challenge Picard in an authoritative way that seems believable and genuine to me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, full disclosure, I remember seeing this episode when I was a kid watching the reruns. And I remember thinking, this is the worst episode i've ever seen and i don't like it i hate it and you know it's a clip show and <laughs> i've always made the jokes about oh boy shades of gray shades of gray because in my mind that is like the bottom of the barrel when it comes to start that's like the rip off at you know but watching it today it wasn't that bad <laughs> like in all honesty like when I, I don't know, it's just maybe because when, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you hate clip shows and every, every series had at least one clip show. It felt like everybody had a clip show where they'd be sitting around the fire and telling stories or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really hated it. And now when I watch it, maybe it's because I knew it was going to be a clip show. So I didn't expect much, but it wasn't, there was a lot more to it than just those clips. It wasn't like 90% clips. It was like 40% or 35%. There was an actual mm -hmm. story going on. There was actual like a little bit of a progression between the relationship between Troy and Riker. Pulaski had some good moments. Chief O'Brien was there. I mean, we had some some story. There was good stuff. And I also thought that the uh, the science behind it the medicine behind it was actually really interesting. And I took a lot of notes on, you know, like it's not quite a virus or a bacteria, but it has aspects of both or something like that. And my first thought was, or elements of both, I think it says, and I was mm -hmm. like, huh, I wonder if that's even possible or like if we're aware of something like that on our planet. So hopefully we'll have Dr. Muhammad Noor or Dr. Uh, Anne Marie Siegel in the free uh, fall that can I explain too, that for I us. I too thought of Dr. Dr. Nor watching the episode. As soon as they mentioned the biofilters and the microbes, uh, I was like, oh, this yep. is this is perfect for Dr. Nor. I know he's gonna give us some some uh, expertise on this. Um yeah, I, you know, there was good story behind it. Uh, you know, were there issues that I felt watching it? Like I wish they could have done a little better here, a little better there. I'm always watching, thinking those kinds of things. For example, uh, when Data and uh, Jordy go on the planet surface to collect the sample of whatever bit Riker, uh, I would think that there would be some kind of containment uh, container to put that thing in, right? Totally. You would bring some kind of, I don't know, vial or a box and say, okay, put the sample in there, close it, mark it with the biohazard, you know, and now let's beam back and, and you know, but, but to hold it like this with tweezers and say, okay, beam me back, I, I thought that's kind of remedial for, you know, for Star Trek. I mean, you know, even in, in today's world, if you're going to go out to the Amazon and collect a, some kind of species of biology somewhere that no, is unknown, you wouldn't just put it you know hold it in your hand say all right let's go back uh, to, the, to the to the laboratory you would put it in some kind of thing and so that it was airtight or sealed and you mm -hmm. know wasn't able to jump out of your hand or, for, or drop on the floor so i thought that was yeah. a small little you know and along those lines 
I was thinking why, you know, I thought the same thing of like, Jordy shouldn't be going down there, just data should. But then Jordy explains it and says, well, I can show you exactly where it was. Okay, that makes sense to me. But then he should be going down in some kind of body suit or standing yeah. well behind data and saying, it's it's over there. See that green thing? Yeah. But he's just coming up in it. He's like sniffing it. He's poking around. I was like, come on. Like, I get that you got to be there. That makes sense. But you got to be way more careful than that. And I did think it was really cool, though. And I watched it like five times. I kept rewinding when the when the vine came at Jordy and data grabbed it super quick. And I yeah. was like trying to rewind it and see if like I could watch Brent Spiner's face anticipating it. Because, you know, when you have to act out something very sudden or quick reaction sometimes it's hard to hide the anticipation you know but he there was no anticipation he played it cool he was just you know in the scene and just reacted really quickly and i wonder if that took a lot of takes you know or if he just nailed it every time but that was big points for brent spiner on that because i you know i definitely rewound and and looked in closely at his performance there yeah, um, very good performance. Um, yeah, I mean, Brent is so amazing, you know, throughout this yeah. uh, show. I, I thought he was just, again, amazing in this episode as well. Um, but yeah, um, and the other little nitpick I had was um, this this de- medical device that they had to, uh you know, make for this episode where Riker is in this brain needle thing. I was thinking, is that the most efficient way to get into somebody's head with like 19 needles probed into their head? Wouldn't it be like better to just put like, you know, patches of, you know, like how we do brain scans now with those electrical grid patches and stuff. Wouldn't that be make, make more sense to actually, because I felt, to, I felt like what if he goes in convulsions and then that right. stuff's just like ripping his yeah, head apart. Yeah, yeah. There's like a yeah. little miniature saw on his head. It's just yeah. havoc all over his yes. frontal cortex or whatever that is. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna literally rip his he's gonna shred his head apart <laughs> if he goes into some kind of you know convulsions or cardiac arrest or something. He he you know, why would you have this needle uh, set up? I, I thought that was a little bit too much it seemed like it would be something that a more primitive um technology would develop so maybe that would be something like you know like a, a klingon medical chair you know like yeah. oh, we're tough we don't care well you know we'll put needles but at a starfleet you know 19 needles put on my head I, that's not i don't want that no, no, don't give me that one i did find so, it fun yeah. to try to name all of the episodes when when the clips started coming yeah. uh i was like okay you know right away it starts doing like a uh, outpost you know the ferengi episode tasha jordy data wharf anybody you know he starts then there was an encounter yeah. at far point where he meets data then there was the flirting scene with guinan but i couldn't remember what episode what the title was of that one then there was saying goodbye mm-hmm. to Troy. Then there was Justice, where he's doing the dances and the massage scene with the naked people. And then mm-hmm. one one zero zero one zero zero one, where he meets Minuet and the Binars. So I was kind of mm-hmm. having fun with that, and I did kind of catch myself going, "Wow, there were more episodes in those first two seasons than it felt like there were." Because there were all these moments and I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot about that. And and so it makes you realize that in just these two short seasons, they actually have done a lot of episodes. They've run the gamut of emotions from comedy to romance and sexuality to seriousness. Riker goes on a Klingon vessel. We deal with Klingons multiple times. There's Von Armstrong in one of those scenes. We've seen Ferengi, I think, three times already. Uh, mm-hmm. Armin Shimmerman playing two different characters. I mean, we've actually done a lot in the first two seasons. And this kind of really, this episode kind of, in a good way, kind of encapsulates everything in the first two seasons and shows us, look at everything we've done and stay tuned for more. Yeah, I mean, and then, you know, by today's standards, they're now 48 episodes into this uh, show. 
I mean, that's five seasons of any other show. That's five seasons of Game of Thrones. You know, that's five seasons of any other new show that's out right now. So we've technically been watching five seasons of what today's episodes would look like, right? Uh, Discovery or any of these shows. So, um, yeah, we've gotten five seasons so far, even though it's only season two. Technically, we've gotten five seasons worth of episodes. And yes, I was reminded by how much we've experienced the whole a uh, flirtation scene with the Irish girl. She's like, what, you don't like girls? And I, I forgot all of these, these moments when they start flashing back. Uh, the one alien that fought Riker, the old man that was really, you know, strong and he was like, wanted him to look inside the box. Um, you know, those episodes that I had forgotten about really kind of, you know, I was reminded of. Um, but also I was reminded um, that, <laughs> they should have called this episode wet dream because that's really what it felt like when i was watching <laughs> yeah that was, was a like... moment that they just kind of kept <laughs> up. they're going yeah. over like Riker saying hey what do you how do i do this and she says you start from the it... top to the bottom and i noticed i was like i didn't notice this when we watched that episode but this time i noticed that he looks at the top of her head and then down to yeah. her feet before he reacts it does he really need to like go Hmm, let me examine up there, yeah. down there. Me likey. Okay, let's do it. But yeah, there were a lot of, there yes. was a lot of that. It was, yeah. it was a lot of, and then, and then what I felt sad for was he's reliving these uh, sexual uh, escapades for the last two seasons in this moment. And Troy's got to hold his hand and, and kind of, she's feeling it too. So just like, it's like he's cheating on her currently like while she's watching almost you know it felt like an even double down of of disrespect to troy and the other thing that i noticed was troy didn't have any of those scenes with him so everybody hooked up with Riker <laughs> so far except for troy yeah all she got was like the lovey-dovey goodbye stuff but i yeah. will say a couple things to that number one is when she was feeling those passionate emotions from him, I wonder if she was thinking, uh, he must be dreaming about me. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what, what I was thinking too. Uh, I feel the same way as you, Will. Thank you. Yeah. You're so Yes, we've had very sexy moments together. And he's like, I haven't even reached your scene yet. <laughs> but I'm the still on thing, the lady in red. <laughs> the other thing that was a little weird was when Troy says, to Pulaski, she says, Will's emotions are very passionate. Okay. Will's emotions are very passionate. And Pulaski goes, as in erotic? Like, whoa, that's quite whoa. a leap. I mean, she guessed correctly, <laughs> but I'm yes. like, all she said was very passionate. And Pulaski has to take it there. Pulaski's like, erotic? Or what, what are we talking about? What if she's like, no, 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 I just mean like she's he's really into the, the sport that he's yeah. watching or he's really having an argument with somebody. But she's like, oh, Pat must be erotic. Tell me all about it. But but she was right. I just thought it was like a weird, uh, quite a jump to go from passionate yeah. into erotic from Pulaski. Uh, there, there was there would be a, a line that would easily clear that up if, if Troy says, well, how do you know it's erotic? And she just. Dr. Pulaski points at his boner and says, well, it's, it's clear. <laughs> She's like, enough said. <laughs> enough said. I mean, you can see it right there. Um, you know, there was a moment watching this episode. <laughs> as I was watching, because, you know, Riker now has uh, got the facial hair in this second season. In this episode, he's got that... Um, you know, the way he wears his goatee and his kind of uh, beard trimmed in that way. Um, and then when they flash back, they have him without the beard, um, kind of the unshaven face. And when he has the unshaven, you know, when, I mean, the shaved face, cl clean, and he has that little dimple in his uh, in his chin, yeah, right? Cleft. I didn't notice that before. Yeah, he has that little cleft in his chin. And as I was watching him uh, in the flashback scenes, I thought to myself uh, how much he reminded me of a kind of a leading man that they were looking for, which is this leading man role. And he also reminded me you know, of Christopher Reeves, uh, who played uh -huh. Superman. 
So there were moments of uh, just the way he plays. It, it, I could I could see a uh, young uh, Jonathan Frakes playing Superman if he was cast um, as you know at, at that role as that role. So he definitely that has the point. physique. He has the size. He has the the charm, and he could easily kind of go back and forth between the Clark Kent and this charming you know man that he he, he always is so that would be amazing uh, able to leap over a single backing of a chair and a single bound <laughs> right in a little hey yeah. uh we're actually gonna hit our uh home run of the oh. episode now but now you got me picturing uh Riker in blue tights i love it and then <laughs> sitting on a chair and then or he straddles a building <laughs> the same way he straddles a chair i don't know who gets the home run of the episode today? Um, yeah. Um, I, I want to give it to. Uh, I, I'm going to give it to Doctor uh, Pulaski. Um. I don't know if we're going to see her again. I don't know if this is the last time we see her or not. But I do know that I thought she really carried this episode. Uh, a lot of medical kind of mumbo jumbo she had to go through and, and talk through and make it believable and sell me on it. She also sold me on the concern. She sold me on uh, uh, like when she told Picard, you know, uh, to get out of my hair. <laughs> She's like, how can I help to get out of my hair? And she said it in a very loving way and a kind of, you know, nice way. But it was sincere, and it was like I, I need to work. You know, give me, let me figure this out. Um, so I would say that I want to give uh, Doctor Pulaski the home run in this. You know what? I think I agree. Um, just because it's not easy to say a bunch of you know medical stuff and make it sound not just believable, but make it sound like you yourself believe it. Uh, like there was another point where Data says, you know, I hope my hypothesis is true. And I was like, that's a mouthful. Hypothesis is true or accurate or something like that. <laughs> but she did it throughout the episode and uh, it worked for me. It sounded like real science to me. And yeah, mm -hmm. she's she's done a lot of work. She's done a lot of heavy lifting over 22 episodes. So yeah, home run of the episode for Dr. Pulaski, uh, Diana Muldar. Uh, also, yeah. I'm going to bring back the nitpick of the week because I do have one. Yeah. When when Pulaski and Troy are talking about negative emotions, Troy says, yeah, he's got negative emotions. But I remember very clearly in a future episode of The Next Generation, she tells Reginald Barkley, there's no such thing as negative emotions or positive emotions. It's They're all regular emotions. It's just what we do with them that are good or bad. So I was very upset about that. Okay. <laughs> I feel better now. I had a lot to get on right. my chest there. <laughs> good. But, but that's true. When they said negative emotions, I was like, wait a second. I remember you saying, please, everybody at home in the comments below, let us know which episode is that when Troy tells Barkley, I believe, there's no such thing as negative emotions. It's what we do with those emotions that's good or bad, something like that. Shouldn't be too tough. It's a Barkley episode. So uh, also some other people that have nothing but positive emotions are our friends, Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England, out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ, Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Baby. Bill Victor Arukin, uh, our good pal Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman on a post, Anil O. Palat, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Joe Balserati, Mike Goo, DQ, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, 
and Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got the free-for-all coming up next. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Shades of Grey, Seventh Rule style. Uh, with Sirach Lofton, of course. Hello, hello. Uh, also joining us today is uh, Melissa Longo, thank goodness. Hello there. We've got Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Uh, Jason Oaken's got his cool poster in the background. Dr. Anne Marie Siegel is going to teach us about medicine, probably. Uh, we've got Allison Leach Hyde wearing an awesome Abyssinian kiosk shirt. Chris McGee's hanging out. He's going to drop some knowledge, I'm sure. Mai is live in Tokyo. She's going to be in and out, I'll just bet. We've got the return of the board queen, Tierney C. Diekman. We've got the classic one, Marsha Schreier. Uh, Faith Howell is on the bridge of the Enterprise D. We've got the party Gorn, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri. We've got the Matt Boardman and Carrie Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear. We've got Greg Kenzo wearing an awesome shirt from uh, Melissa Longo. You can get that at the Introverted Republic. For, oh, boy, you guys. Hmm. First things first. <laughs> Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. You are in for a treat today. <laughs> I saw this one. <laughs> uh, whoa, I don't Every know. Time. Let's see. So Let's see. <laughs> hey, flashback episode. Uh, good, good science talk. Great Pulaski moments. What do you think? Uh, honestly, I don't even know. <laughs> Because because there were so many flashbacks in this, I can't tell you how they graded it. But I'm going to say seven, just to play it safe. I'm going to go with a straight seven. That's a safe bet. Uh, does anybody else have any guesses as to what it was scored on IMDb that doesn't already have an idea? Does it go into the negatives? <laughs> can, I pull it, can I pull a TJ and say I, I one dollar? I think Q Space and, and, and Greg's background is an appropriate response. <laughs> I'm going to say three. We'll, we'll go with Patrick Ewing. Know, I know this we'll, one. We'll go with though, Patrick but Ewing, but really his guess. number, not his height. 4.7. Wow. Ooh, Star Trek number. I often or, wonder when we do these episodes, if because a lot of us go in and rate them, if it actually is enough to change I the rating. I should hope so. But because in this <laughs> case, if enough of us went in and tend it, we might have actually upped it. From what it was, but uh, I, I remember what it was when I went into it, and um, uh, if I recall, it is still the lowest rated uh, episode on IMDb of at least the next gen and TOS era treks. I don't know about any new trek if any discoveries get that low or anything like that, but uh, it's bad. It's a real bad. Wow. So, does wow. anybody else have any guesses? <laughs> Let's see a 3.2 on the board. I'm going to say 3.3. Wow. Jeez. These guys are ruthless. It is nowhere near that. It is the lowest rated Star Trek episode ever by like ever. two points. <laughs> I believe, yeah, it is a 3.3. No, TJ, way. was that you? Loop, TJ. Wow. That was scores. TJ. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> Ever? Faith with a three point, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we didn't lot. we didn't raise the score. I think then. some people looked at it <laughs> by a lot, but I think you, you guys, I think maybe this is, deserves a revisit to that IMDb score, and I think people should maybe reconsider their yeah, voting yeah. because I sure did upon viewing this. However, uh, did we have any non-appearance mentions? I feel like everybody appeared in the clips, right? That's what yeah, like it, yeah. All right. Well, Melissa Longo, please and appearances. get us off on the right track here. Mm -hmm. Oh, your picture's a little gray. A little bit. It matches my shirt, <laughs> which is great. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, get it off on the right foot. Actually, I'm surprised that this has the lowest rating of all of the Star Trek episodes mm. ever. I, I would have thought that um, Code of Honor would have been much lower. 
<laughs> I thought it would have tanked, the, you know. <laughs> um, but um, because it, it had some really good moments in it for me, it to me it had a lot of good moments. Um, there was a mystery, you know. It started out with a mystery um and a problem to solve and i like that pulaski and troy are the ones that are trying to solve this problem together um of saving will Riker's life um and that's interesting to me um and there was uh well and then you have chief o'brien at the beginning <laughs> and making funny jokes <laughs> saying, I think I remember the coordinates. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's always good to see O'Brien. Um, and at the very end, the last scene where Riker said, <laughs> says, of course I know who I am. I am Jean-Luc Picard, captain of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> and Picard <laughs> says, I'm delighted that you're feeling better, captain. The Admiral and I were worried about you. And then David <laughs> Jackson with his, I didn't know you had that authority. That that was really cute. Um, and then the moment when um Pulaski and Troy figured out where they kind of almost embrace, that was a special moment um to me. And um yeah, and I I also wanted to give a shout out to Marina Sirtis because she, I feel like that she hasn't been given the best work to work with, you know, the best material to work with, but she's always committed to her character. She always brings some kind of substance to maybe some shallow writing. So um, yeah, kudos to her. And I, and I feel that, that Troy's concern for Riker stems from a genuine place, so. Mm -hmm. And I do have things for things left unsaid. <laughs> Excellent. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Melissa Longo with the gray shirt. Uh, well, everybody's shirt is gray right now. Dr. Susan <laughs> V. Gruner, what's up? What did you think of this masterpiece? Be honest. I completely forgot about this episode. And then <laughs> when it got in a little bit, I thought, oh, <laughs> oh my God, those those flashbacks from the what's the name of the episode with the the scantily clad people Justice. it made me I was laughing so hard I literally hurt my stomach I was laughing so hard I thought what the hell what happened do we know why they was there a strike or something why did they go with all is that what the reason no, was it was it was ah. to save money because they had done like the boring episodes and other things so it's like a popular miscon misconception that this one was a strike one ah uh, well i wondered what the, i knew something had to have been going on for them to resort to doing what they did so i i laughed a lot and then i watched the rest and i thought oh my god i'm never gonna watch this one ever again as long as i live <laughs> well that's too bad we were hoping to cover it again next week <laughs> Thanks oh, very yeah. much, Dr. Susan B. Gruner. Sorry, I'm sorry to be so negative. Not at all. Jason Oaken is also here, everybody, and he read the entire script. He said it was 11 <laughs> pages long. What would you think of this one? <laughs> Interesting enough, it was not 11 pages long. They managed to put all the clip scenes right into the script. I don't know for what reason. Oh. So the script actually is thicker than it usually is because there's a wow. lot of descriptive information here. Although it, oh. it made it easier to flip because they do name the scenes. Uh, it, you know, I, I think uh, the you know the only kind of great thing about this episode is that you can watch it in about 20 minutes. Uh, if you fast forward everything, just like you can <laughs> flip pages. I certainly, you know, they ran out of money. Uh, and they had to do something. And and, and frankly, this is, yeah, strictly speaking, I guess the second clip show for Star Trek, the first one was amazing simply because they, they've utilized the cage so well. I mean, some people don't even call it a clip show, but in a way it is. And the envelope is interesting and it gives you something to look at. It's probably one of the one of the better episodes of the original series. This is sort of certainly a nadir of the second season, I think. Not, nothing is even close. 
And uh, to me, it, frankly, I mean, I understand the financial uh, constraints, the timing constraints, but to me, it's just a failure of imagination. Even the clips that they've chosen are not the best. Sometimes they don't fit uh, what they're trying to show. So th th there's that piece of it as well. We do not need to revisit some of the worst parts of the first two seasons. I understand it may have been slim pickings, but uh, what they what they decided to choose was not great. And you know, I can go on for a while, and I'll say quite a bit of it for later. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll say a couple of things that are actually somewhat positive here. One is Diana Moldau's performance. It's the last time we see her, and she's giving it her all, her all, even though. I think everybody understands what kind of nonsense they're doing here. She's really into it. Kind of reminded me of, uh, in, in a way that Shatner was throwing himself completely in and in, into those horrible scripts at the end of the Star Trek run. So it kind of gave me those types of flashbacks. She's really sort of going in. She probably had the meatiest part of them all here. If there's anything in this episode, uh, I, I you know I think Rob Bowman did whatever he could. I think there were only two camera setups on the, on, uh, on the pla on the planet set. Uh, obviously, you know, they had a little bit in the transporter room and the, and the rest of us in sick bay. Were <laughs> the setups. I mean, the, the, obviously, they tried to do this, what, in three days? So, you know, right. as much as mm -hmm. as much as they could do, I think he milked quite more of, uh, from the sick bay scenes than probably had any right to. I mean, they did use Ron Jones's music. My sort of, uh, to my ear, it seemed like a lot of it was just basic old music that was just, you know, put together. I don't know if there's any new music for this one. Probably wasn't. So it was kind of a quickie, and again, uh, I guess they had to put out an episode, and they did, but maybe it would have been better not to. Wow. <laughs> Scathing. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Mr. Jason Oaken. All right, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, we mentioned you earlier because there's a lot of science and medicines. So we're like, hopefully we get Mohammed or Anne-Marie in this uh, free-for-all. What did you think of this particular episode? Okay. So what some call nonsense, I would call ages ahead of its time neurosurgery. I think it's so brilliant. Like, so when I saw this episode already, I thought it was so interesting in that scene where like Riker's head is in that frame and they're sticking needles in him that just like really sticks with you from a horror perspective, but also like, wow, that's fascinating. How are they lo localizing where the needle goes? So when I was in my neurosurgery rotation, like one of my first cases was being in the OR for a deep brain stimulation, which at that time was like a new treatment for Parkinson's disease. And basically it's done the exact same way. I mean, no empath is standing there, but instead you have like the deep brain stimulation, like it's hooked up to your brain waves. And as they're sticking like the needle in, it moves the brain waves, to, brain waves to show you like where in the brain it is. And the frame actually is like keeping everything in place so that you can like do this very specific localization. So to me, I think this, this is actually one of my favorite science episodes, like for that reason. And also just like the pathology of the bite that Riker, I guess you'd call it a bite that Riker gets and how that progresses. I just think it's brilliant. And, you know, even like different feelings have different neurotransmitters and that can like be localized to different parts of the brain and cause different things. So I love that. And I think Dr. Pulaski is like such a wonderful underrated doctor of Star mm -hmm. Trek. And this episode really makes me feel like even before we knew that this was the last one she'd appear in, I remember seeing at the time thinking like, you know what, after all these episodes, I'm going to miss her. And so I just think it's great. And it's wonderful to see two women of science working together and figuring out a problem. And I love this episode. Also, it was like the 20th century and there were clip shows and everything. And I would say this yeah. is a really great one. And I think Eric did such a great job choosing the clips. Like, with like a week ahead of a week lead time running up to it and just having VHSs to like scroll through. And that was brilliant. And I mean, it has the hottest montage ever. And, <laughs> and when I watched it originally, my dad used to like go like this to me in my sister's <laughs> eyes. And this Riker montage got so much like hand over eyes action. Like, um, Amy. It's just super fun. <laughs> and it's also like super fun seeing everybody's background because I actually watched TNG in black and white. And the second I saw everybody's change, I was like, no, oh, it's like how I originally saw it. Like, you have to say, like, this show does look great in black and white. Hey, uh, real quick, Amory, before we move on, not a bacteria, not a virus, but with elements of both. Is that something that exists here on this planet? I was going to ask that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And there are a lot of different, like, diseases where there can be elements of, like, different, like, a parasite in a virus or a parasite in bacteria, like, 
I mean, and that's just what we know about. Interesting. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Anne Marie Seagal. I also noticed Dr. Sue was yeah, nodding her head as well. Oh, you tend it. I'm gonna I'm gonna revisit One of my favorites. it too because I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever seen when I was a kid. But upon watching it today, I was like, it's not that bad, but it's probably because so I had no expectation. Yeah. Well, look, Allison Leach Hyde is here. What is up with you, Allison? And what did you think of this episode? Hello. What do I think of this episode? I had to watch it twice. I fell asleep the first time. It's not one that was on a lot as a kid, so it's relatively new. You know, I only got on rewatching as an adult. Um, what I do really like about it is Frakes does a lovely job of being the commander and like I'm going through this very hard thing. I, I'm I'm dying, but I can still teach everyone under my command how to do this with Briggs. And I thought he did a wonderful job of showing that. And as someone who has also gone through a fairly sudden medical issue where it was not a pleasant situation, you know, it is something you think about like, okay, no, I, I want to show that Yes, this is scary, but I can still be me while I go through it. You know, he still has his twinkle in his eye. He's still cracking jokes. And I really appreciated that. I thought that was lovely and he did a great job. And I also really liked getting a little bit of Jordy and Data having their friendship down on the planet. And Jordy's like, I have to rely on your quick reflexes of like, okay, at least there's some fun in this episode too, even though it is slow. It prods along, but you know, it's, it's something I will probably skip on rewatches from now on, but there are pleasant things about it, even though it's not terribly exciting. And of course, it's lovely also to see, as Lisa said, getting Troy and Pulaski having good working relationships and working mm -hmm. through a problem together and saving the day. And so that's also quite enjoyable. Mm hmm. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Allison Leach Hyde. All right, Chris McGee is like Ryan. You stole my fucking question. What have you got for us today? I'm sorry for doing that. And I had so few notes to begin with here. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I'll start with a little bit, bit of a, um, a confession. I haven't seen a whole lot of. Uh, shows back in the 80s and 90s i wasn't i wasn't into television back then i didn't even watch tng until much later in the late 90s when i had to rent it from a video store um so i haven't seen you know clip show episodes from other shows of this era so i don't know if it's typical to have a frame story kind of like this perhaps i'm almost, almost certain i'm in the minority here but i think this kind of method of having a story to explain why we're seeing these clips is at least halfway decent, uh, especially given the circumstances. Uh, I mean, after all, the clips don't even uh, begin until a third of the way, like 16 minutes into the episode. So you don't even know it's a clip show until you're already sucked in. <laughs> um, I will say uh, even O'Brien gets a chance to shine in this episode. I'm convinced this episode probably would have been rated on IMD uh, 1.2 if it were not for Miles, Miles uh, 2. Point O'Brien here to help lift it up. Anyway, um, one little note that I saw that just I'm, I'm kind of curious about is during, of course, all the rapid fire clips there towards the end, we see one little short clip from conspiracy that was of course the gory scene that was in that episode censored or even removed entirely i don't know which in the uk i'm wondering if this episode shades of gray was also censored similarly to that um like jason i enjoyed ron jones's music even if it is just recycled it's fine ron jones is fantastic with his music um yeah not any non-appearance mentions there are plenty of non-mention appearances uh too many to go into like minuet mistress beata and so forth and so on but um as for my memorable quote of the episode uh the obvious ones i i'm sure you've already touched upon in the earlier segment so i'll pick one that isn't quite as 
uh, memorable, I guess. And that is facing death is the ultimate test of character. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Chris McGee. All right. Uh, Faith Howell is here on the bridge of the Enterprise D. What's up, Faith? What did you think of this one? So as a child of the 80s and 90s, I grew up with episodes like this from probably just about every series that I watched at the time. And so, yeah, I kind of, I guess I've bought into everybody's complaints about them recently, but watching it, I didn't hate it as much as I thought I was going to. Um, I didn't remember the story piece, the frame, as um, Chris dubbed it. Um and so I I kind of enjoyed that bit. And I that's some of the clip shows that I do remember from other shows like Castle, especially. Um, that's been some of my favorite pieces that it's nice sometimes to be able to go back and see these touch points and remember where you've been and relive some of the better moments. Um, I don't know that it was a great choice to do as the season finale, but um, I don't know what was going on in the writer's room at that time either um, and what you know choices they had to make for budgeting or whatever the, the reason was. Um, but I, I think overall it's not nearly as bad as I expected it to be. Um, and I, yeah, like, I liked going back and seeing all those memories yeah, it's funny when we expect it to be terrible. That's when we go, that's not so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks very much, Faith. What's up, Marsha? Classic Schreier. What did you think of this particular episode? Did you love it? I, I loved the fact that it finally ended season two, which, as you all know, is not my favorite. Um, but it wasn't rewatching it for the first time in many, many, many years today. Um, it wasn't as bad as I remembered it. And I, I'd be anxious to see what everybody thinks of this episode compared to Spock's brain when we get <laughs> to that. Mm -hmm. Because that was always considered, you know, one of the worst uh, Trek episodes ever. Um, a lot of people have said things that I was going to say, and I've been crossing off notes. Um in terms of the clips, I was surprised that they didn't use Icarus Factor or Measure of a Man, because those were, I mean, the fights that Riker had with his father in Icarus mm -hmm. Factor probably would have knocked out those neurons, you know, in five minutes. Um, and Measure of a Man, he was, you know, so emotional, when, especially the scene where he's taking out um, uh, Data's arm. You know, he was, that was... To me, those were obvious. The ones they used were like episodes I never wanted to see again anyway. Um, my understanding is the reason for this clip show is because Q Who earlier in the season went double uh, budget. And because That's the writer's the strike was at the beginning of the year, they didn't have enough scripts left over that they could film. I don't know. Uh, Jason probably knows better than me. Um, but um that's my understanding that they had you know nothing to work with basically um i also love the o'brien line i hope these are the right coordinates but um kudos to jonathan frakes who really did a lot with not much um and i loved his grandfather and the snake story mm -hmm. that's all i got Great stuff. <laughs> that snake. That was a good story. That was the Chuck Norris joke of the week. Thank you very much, Marsha. Tierney C. <laughs> Diekman has returned. Looks like she's drinking out of her uh, Voyager mug. That's pretty cool. What did you think of this episode? Pretty great, right? You know, it wasn't as bad as I recalled it. It's really easy to give in to the hype of an clip show. They're uh, often ridiculed. And actually, uh, I looked up just for the heck of it um when the first instance of a clip show tv show happened and uh back i think 30s 40s not 30s 40s that seems way too early but it way the heck back when like three stooges uh started doing it and especially you know when there wasn't a whole lot of syndication and replays and things like that it was a great way to help audiences that didn't start at the beginning and uh weren't 
you know, really familiar with things to remember what had happened or get an idea of things that went on. So the the concept, you know, wasn't what it wasn't exactly new. And the funny thing was, is going through at least the Wikipedia article, this episode is specifically mentioned um, as a reason for a clip show f- due to budget constraints. Hmm. Uh, so there's a little excerpt in the in the Wikipedia article about clip shows for Shades of Grey. And as Anne-Marie brought up, um, they had dubbed it during the writing process, Riker's Brain, and almost uh, had considered calling the episode that, which is hilarious as was thought to Spock's brain, but uh, I do believe that is rated considerably higher on IMDb than this. So it's kind of gotten a bad rap over time. And I wonder if it's a bit of a hive mind sort of, it's a clip show, it must be terrible. When the the framing story, which I'd also forgotten until rewatching this, is actually pretty darn interesting. And I'm really glad like all the things that you and Marie and Allison brought up were are in my notes too, because the the science and the life and death and the medical, I just had to deal with that myself with my own operation of, hey, the risks for this are super high and were terrifying. I love his approach to it of I'm going to go out with my boots on if I have to. I'm still going to be myself and might as well laugh about it because why the heck not? And then the is just silly as it was because he's still twitching the whole time. But the neural stimulation is at least some of the the research into it is something I'm semi familiar with um, as a potential treatment with epilepsy myself. So it was just kind of like I want more of this. I really wish they had been able to just do away with the clips, which could have been better choices, more from Riker's point of view, less um, Riker lady fest. And I love how he had two terrible memories of people dying. And then the rest of his bad memories just started with him getting his ass handed to him. So like, mm-hmm. that was great. Uh, but it, um, I, I would have liked to have known more about uh, the organism in his leg, you know, the, the, how the hollow filters couldn't, they couldn't filter it out, you know, have a parasitic entity, have a bottle episode in uh sick bay with, with Pulaski. This is her last episode. We didn't know that at the time or the viewers didn't at the time. Uh, it's a really great point to bring up, but she was phenomenal. I really liked her. I, I liked her as uh as an actor and she and troy worked beautifully in that episode their performances are great given what they had to work with i just wanted to know more of what was going on with them how how are they again pinpointing the spots you know to find this learn more about the neurotransmitters affecting his emotions what is troy feeling from him have more create scenes of them together in his past before he was on the enterprise with her good memories, bad memories, their breakup, their time together, more about more about that um, and just keep it constrained in the sick bay and have it be a new a new entity that they discover within Riker that is using him. They could have done something with that at the time. And I don't know, maybe just with writing and strikes, it wasn't possible and nobody thought about that. So it makes me a little sad that they couldn't do something with that you know as i say 30 years down the line um but it wasn't it wasn't as bad as i as i remember it was actually just laughable of oh my god every single one of his good memories is and is just another another lady another conquest coming in and another cringy episode at another terrible point and i don't envy i can't remember his name now who the consultant that had to go in and pick Eric apart still well Thank you. Yeah. Um, Our guest from earlier today, in fact. Episodes. Yeah, and do that. That must have been excruciating. Like, after a while, he probably was just like, yeah, this could be better, but I don't care. <laughs> like, but, um, yeah, there's a lot more that could be that could be said. But overall, it deserves better than a 3.3. It really does. We can we we can do better than that, guys. There's got, there are worse. We know there are worse. We all know there are worse. They're coming. They're coming up fast. Scary. Yeah. Well, lucky for us, we don't have worse coming up. It's all great people all the time in our free for alls. Thank you very much, Tierney. Greg Kenzo is a great example of that. What's up, Greg? What do you think of this one? What's up? Uh, this one started off well. I was like, 
doing my regular thing, I was like, oh, oh okay, this this is a fascinating premise, you know, with the the tree that like spikes people. And then I was going, and then I was like, wait, what? And then it was clip show. And I was like, okay. You know, it gave me some time to uh not gonna lie, I just watched this one recently and I had forgot it was a clip show. So that's kind of what tells you that it's not the most memorable one. Um let's see. I did get a philosophy from the beginning of the episode. Like I said before, I do like kind of extracting a philosophy from these. So bear with me on this. Riker, okay, let's see. Riker says, drop a hammer on your foot. It's hardly useful to get mad at the hammer. Right. And that's kind of, they also go on to say, or Picard says, things. these things happen when Riker's in the chair. Or not chair. He's on the he's on the table. On the table. Um, and then Riker says, "I'm surprised they don't happen more often. After all, we are." And I was like, "Yeah." Well, I was thinking that right when the episode started, I was like, "Why doesn't this happen more often?" They're going down to like alien planets. Half the things on our planet, or maybe not half, maybe not, but the animals on our planet have ways that they can kill you. With like defensive lethality so it would make sense that these alien planets have species with that same thing anyway so i focused on that but after hearing what everybody had to say about the clip show you know it actually is done really well like they integrate it into the story um australia is yes little animals that can kill you and so it would make sense that you would have different Australias in like, I don't know, name a planet that Star Trek they go to. Anyway, um, yeah, not the best episode, but maybe it's not a 3.3. I would probably give it, I won't say what I'll give it, but. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks very much, Greg. Good stuff, as always. Mai is live in Tokyo. What do you think of this one, Mai? What's up? Barely alive. Can you guys see me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, cool. My my internet is weird this morning. Um, so my thoughts on this, nobody likes a clip episode, clip episode especially aficionados of Friends, where it's just abused with reckless abandon. Um, but but that's not my main thought about this episode. And I got love you, Emery, but I got to disagree. The, the the science on this was just complete nonsense. Um, it, it evokes memories of my first year in uh, in college about 100 years ago. Um, I decided to formally study pharmacology, <laughs> having just graduated from four years of intense, ungraded, focused uh, pharmacology lab work, a.k.a. high school in Berkeley in the late 70s. Um, I, I, so... In this episode, they try to stimulate negative brain endorphins to crush the virus. First of all, endorphins are, are present throughout the body in both the peripheral and central nervous systems, and they're neither good nor bad. They just exist. Uh, in the peripheral nervous system, they block pain. In the central nervous system, they allow extra dopamine and, and hence lots of joyous feelings. Now, look at the term endorphin itself. It's, a, it's derived from two words, endogenous and morphine, or in other words, morphine produced in the body. So... If they really wanted to, to fix Riker, they would have simply needed to grab a hypo spray of morphine rather than the nonsense with the dreams. In fact, if they really wanted a quick acting solution, they could have used heroin, which breaks down into two types of morphine in the blood and which crosses what's called the blood brain barrier or a, a sort of fence that protects the brain about 35 times faster than morphine due to this really cool property called lipophilicity or the ability to dissolve, to dissolve lipids in lipids rather than water which is a neat trick. If only someone would reverse that process and sell it in a cream, I could rub on selected parts of my body before a shower, just wash the fat away. I'd be a size 10 in no time at all. Come on, science, make it happen. Um, and even if they did use these potent drugs, they could clear up any associated addiction by doing whatever they did in the Neutral Zone episode to fix Sonny Clemens. So some atrociously bad science this episode put me off far more than the clips of the past episodes. And, and that takes some doing. So on to season three is what I say. Ooh, <laughs> that is exciting. We've been waiting for season three for quite some time and it's almost here. 
Our time is finally near. Isn't that right? TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri. What do you think of this episode? That is right. That is right. I have faith of the heart. <laughs> My time is finally near. It's been so long. <laughs> uh, oh, I enjoyed uh, this episode. I've never had you know, all of these strongly expressed feelings about it. I've always uh, enjoyed it. It's an episode of Star Trek and I like Star Trek. So there's that. Uh, I'm watching today, you know, I really appreciate it. And, and I think Allison and, and Greg kind of touched on Commander Riker's attitude about uh, what was going on. Um, and we just, you know, got finished watching an episode uh, where, uh, Commander Riker's joviality and his command style are, are you know, discussed. And, you know, we see that that's, that's the core of who he is uh, because he's willing to go down that way and, and continue to teach. Like, he's, it, it's not a show. It's not a it's not a, a, a put on and it's not something he does because he takes his job like lightly. He takes it seriously and he's teaching, you know, his crew to, you know, how to how to deal with all the crazy stuff that they encounter. Um, and that, you know, you don't have to be, you know, upset and depressed or or mad about it. And like you said about the hammer, if you don't it's not gonna get mad at the hammer, it didn't do anything. Like it's just it's just doing what hammers do. It fail. It's it's heavy, it hurts if it falls on you. Um, and I also appreciate, uh, you know, his line about uh, most life forms acting out of an instinct for survival and not out of malice. And so, you know, he didn't feel like the plant hated him or the planet was trying to kill him or, or you know, any of those things. And he also wasn't mad about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that there's a lesson in that, uh, at, at least for me, um, and even in dealing with people, most people also are, are only trying to act in their best interest. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and say, I want to be the worst. <laughs> Everybody uh, probably just, you know, is trying to do the best they can or just trying to get by. Um, and, you know, wherever, wherever we find them and encounter them, you know, no matter what our interaction is, that's usually what most people are doing. And I, I feel that I can connect with people better even when there's a misunderstanding or conflict, you know, when I approach it from, from that angle that, Oh, they're just doing, you know, just trying to get by, just trying to survive just like everybody else. Um, and so, you know, I feel, feel appreciation that that's commander Riker's approach in life. I also think that the, the memories that they brought up kind of show us, you know, who he is. Um, and, you know, for, for the obvious, none story reasons we didn't you know see much of him before he came on the ship or i mean obviously there are a lot of more emotional moments uh you know that he went through um and we've heard about some of them um but um and i think these these memories kind of you know really start to show us who he is um <laughs> you know we mentioned the the kind of ladies man you know moments you know the things that maybe, you know, he found pleasure and enjoyed. And then, you know, we see like some of the things that kind of scared him. Uh, so, you know, that helps us to know that, okay, this guy can be scared. He has strong emotions about it. Uh, and <laughs> we have Deanna to sit there and narrate to us what the emotions are, just kind of interesting and, you know, not something that, uh, that we encounter in this world. I don't think anybody's going to be by my bedside saying what I'm dreaming about and, saying if I'm having a good time or a bad time, but, but that's, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that and interesting to see that they were able to use that to help fix the problem. Uh, because, you know, her telling uh, Dr. Pulaski, you know, what he's, what he's going through and seeing the results of how it's affecting these, you know, microorganisms, um, you know, was instrumental in curing him. So, you know, I thought the episode was interesting. Uh, I actually also even enjoyed the clips. Yep. Most of them. Thanks very much. TJ Jackson Bay out Missouri, the party Gorn, Carrie Schwent, AKA crafty bear. What's up with you? What did you think of this episode? I enjoy clip shows. I don't hate them as much as, as, as some people do. One of my 
favorite episodes of Dr. Quinn is a clip show. It's the one they do before, right before Mike and Sully get married. They're having their premarital counseling and they're going through all the steps that they went through to get to to get to get to the wedding. And I love that. And we have a nice, also nice rom- bit of a micro romantic scene with Riker and Riker and Deanna. Every time Imzadi come comes out, it just it it warms my heart. I love that. Just that tiny little moment between between the two of them. This does not deserve a three point three. Let's. I will. Def, I will defend that one. It's a nine. Darn it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I, I was. I was languages. with you when you said not a three point three, but when you said a nine, it kind of took me back. I'm, sorry. Please. Continue. I'm sorry. I. I. I liked it. Some of the clips were a, were a lot of fun. It's got. They they included probably one of my favorite scenes from the first two seasons. Makes me laugh out loud every time with Riker and Guinan and, and them sort of play acting and making Wesley squirm. That scene will make me laugh for <laughs> absolutely forever. And I very much en- enjoy the watching the when Riker and Data first meet on the on the holodeck in the, in that first episode. I think it's a great scene between the two of them. I have a note on that that's something something I noticed, but I'll sa- I'll save that for for later. And I came up with the idea a little a little while back of what to do for the for the limerick for this for this episode. And Melissa already knows and she sort of guessed when we were we were talking before. I'm going to attempt to cover my camera for a moment because it sort of contains a little Easter egg as to what the limerick will contain. And we'll see if you guys can figure out the craziness that my brain created. It can be fun to try something new. A Klingon's heart beats only for glory. Suddenly your eyes meet. One zero, one zero. It's time to give the ship a reprieve. All kinds of mixed up, just like the episode in. Yeah, that was a uh, fun stuff can come from that. That was a limerick clip show right there. Uh, good <laughs> stuff. A limerick clip. Yeah. clip a Easy rock. That was a close one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 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 I'm about to write that down. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Carrie. I agree with you. Clip shows are the best, and I will say, Matt Boardman, tell me if you agree. My favorite clip show episode. The final episode of Deep Space Nine. What do you think? And what do you think of this episode? Aww. It is it is a clip show. There are some clips. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so watching the episode today, I had this come to mind, and I <laughs> good, good, give in to your hate. You young Riker, like your father, are now mine. <laughs> <laughs> I sorry, I'm I'm special in the head. Um, I it's so interesting to me to, you know, because having watched this episode in a time in which we didn't have the Internet and, you know, as as time has gone on, the advent of the Internet and more people discussing this stuff, I was surprised to find so many people who don't like this episode because I do. Um, I think that it's a fun episode. I love the clips there are some clips in there that are among my favorite moments from the first season uh i i don't know why but i do i love when Riker meets data for the first time on the holodeck that's i don't know i just i think it's uh you know it was wonderful to watch that interaction that and it's in its innocence in a way you know and it's just to be reminded of uh the beginning of that that friendship there um i love seeing yeah i mean yes we do (laughs) he does we do tend to focus on some of riker's romances and and everything like that but i i couldn't help but feel like as i i saw a, a comment from eric stillwell about his feelings on this episode and they were very strongly not happy at least what was uh what was quoted and and I think that, you know, for those of us who who are creatives, um, I think it is so easy to be very critical of our own work 
Um, mm-hmm. I know at least for myself, I look at stuff and I'm just like, oh my gosh, that is just hot garbage, you know, like, like nobody's going to like that or whatever. And, and so if Eric is listening to this, I would like to just say to him, this episode was not as bad as, as you think it is. It actually, I, I think it had a fun premise and given the restraints that, that were there at this point in time, put, put upon you by the studio. I mean, look, when the studio speaks, you, you really don't have much of a choice, but to follow that. And so given, given those restraints, I think that this was an effective use of, of that uh, creative power that you had available to you. It's good stuff. Thank you very much. The Matt Boardman, or as uh, our good buddy, Scott Jensen calls you classic, the Matt. All right. Uh, Jake's final take. Sirach, what do you think? There's so much more to say about this episode. What do you say? Yeah, there's a lot to say. And it's great that everybody has so much to say about such a crappy episode. It's interesting to me. <laughs> that, <laughs> that there's so much to say. Uh, so mm-hmm. let me say, um, I wanted to give a little props to the props. And that's, there was a device, medical device, looked like a gyroscope mm-hmm. of some sort. Yeah. I thought that yes. was a cool, I thought that was a cool mm-hmm. medical device. Mm-hmm. Whoever yes. designed it, came up with it. Props to them. Uh, in the props department. So I wanted to say shout out to them really quickly. Also, the idea of this plant that is carnivorous. I mean, if you eat this plant, are you still a a vegetarian? Um, Or does that cross the rules? I thought that would be something to explore as well. Interesting kind of idea. Hmm. Yes. Uh, Just plants eating eating animals. I thought, wow, that's pretty Mm -hmm. interesting. Like, you never hear that. I can answer that. If you eat the plant... You're safe yeah. as long as the plant has not eaten in 24 hours. But if the plant has eaten in 24 hours, you are eating its leftover rhino and it's or something. I, I don't know about that one. I think there's a challenge <laughs> for that. But let's just, <laughs> I, I think it raises the question, you know, uh, definitely sparked a little bit of interest in my mind. Uh, another thing I want to give uh, credit to for this show they essentially killed Tasha Yar last season and still have brought her up many times, even up until mm-hmm. the new show. They still brought her, uh, keep referring to her. And I give credit to Star Trek for doing that because in most cases, when they do get rid of a character on a show, they don't refer to them anymore. They try to ignore them. They try to forget about them. But to their credit, they have continuously brought Tasha Yar back and kept reminding us of the times that she spent on that bridge. So I want to give props for that as well. Um, Also, I believe that Troy has a real unconditional love for Riker. Mm -hmm. She she, she doesn't judge him. She doesn't um, give him a hard time for whatever she knows that he's doing. Um, she's accepting of him, however he is. And that is a real kind of open uh, relationship that was not really a common thing at that time. It's something that's more common now, uh, people having kind of more open relationships. But I feel like the way she loves Riker is, 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 is particularly special. And I felt that love in this episode when she was kind of, um, you know, by his side at the, on the medical table. So uh, kudos to her for just really having a genuine love for Riker and showing them. And um, lastly, I just wanted to agree with TJ on his uh, takeaway line. I felt like it was one of the big takeaway lines for me as well. And that is <clears throat> most life forms act out of an instinct for survival. And I feel like we see that playing out all around the world, um, just in different conflicts and circumstances Mm -hmm. people are trying to uh have this instinct for survival and it causes actions whether you agree with them or not and um i think that's that's uh, a big takeaway for me it seemed like a truth that resonated with me when i heard it spoke in this episode so um yeah those are those are my final takes on this uh 
this 3.3, which I don't think it deserved a 3.3, because I feel like I've seen worse episodes than this. Yeah. But I didn't walk away <laughs> from this episode saying, this is the worst episode I've ever seen. Right. It wasn't the greatest, but I didn't feel that when I watched it. So, you know, um, I don't think it was really deserving of that. Maybe it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction because people wanted more, but uh, mm. it, it wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. Instinct for survival, not malice. That was what it was. It's a good line. Mm -hmm. And the Chuck Norris line was really good too. But uh, (laughs) anyway, thanks very much, everybody. We got to run. Thank you to Melissa Longo, Dr. Susan B. Gruner, Jason Oaken, Dr. Anne-Marie Seagull, Allison Leach Hyde. We've got Chris McGee, Greg Kenzo, Tierney C. Deekman, Marsha Classic Schreier, Faith Howell, Carrie Schwent, the Matt Boardman, classic The Matt, uh, TJ Jackson Bay, uh, send a prayer his way. He's a Memphis Grizzlies fan at the moment. Uh, and my oh, wow. live in <laughs> Tokyo. It's a rough season. So far. <laughs> no, the Grizzlies oh, wow. are suspended. Yeah. Uh, for myself, for Ciroc, uh, for Melissa Longo and Aaron Eisenberg, uh, something's got me. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in and always remember the seventh rule.